Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be back here uh, at this amazing gathering. Um, Linda Colley, uh, who's currently professor of history at Princeton University, began her career at Cambridge University as a historian of 18th century Britain. That's to say the century in which the kingdoms of the British Isles united into a single Great Britain, a political union which fought wars with Europe, lost its North American colonies, sorry, du during a century uh, which fought repeated uh, wars with Europe, lost its Northern American colonies, and acquired an empire in India. That's to say a century which has shaped Britain politically, economically, culturally, and even psychologically ever since and whose legacies are still actively unraveling across those small, proud, and now rather angry isles. Linda Colley first came to public attention in the early 1990s through her book, Britons, which probed the nature of Britain and British national identity at a moment when Britain, just coming out of the Thatcher era, was itself unsure of what kind of island nation it was. With the age of empire behind it, many thought that Britain's now future now lay in becoming a European nation, in integrating further with Europe. And in that book, Linda Colley traced the making of modern Great Britain through four great arenas of activity. War, above all, naval warfare. Free trade, which placed Britain in opposition to the mercantilist regulation of continental Europe and European powers, faith in the Protestant religion, which set it apart from Catholic France, and the pursuit of empire at the expense of European rivals. And any reasonably close reader of Colley's book, which appeared at what now looks like the heyday of Britain's relationship with Europe, any reasonably close reader would have recognized through her account the massive extent through which British identity was created out of opposition to and in contrast with Europe, a historical legacy that, as we now know, has proved to be too powerful to shake off. And by the way, she was one of the few to predict uh, that the Brexit uh, side was going to win the vote last summer. That book, Britain's, won professional prizes and even perhaps more importantly, it stirred discussions about the nature of British identity. It gained her invitations to speak on the subject at Downing Street and in many other forums across Britain and across the world. And it established her as one of her country's most significant public intellectuals. As a historian, Linda Colley has, been, has had a global sensibility from long before it became cool to do so. She has been distinguished by her confidence in posing great and fundamental questions about the significance of war and religion, for instance, about the effects of territorial scale and demographic size, or the nature of national identity, and of hunting down answers to these big questions through the imaginative use of nominally small sources ranging from visual images, prints and tableau, uh, to diaries, ship logs, and to new kinds of data which has become available through the internet. And it's this dual approach, big questions pursued through a command of a diverse array of supposedly small sources that's on wonderful display in the book she's going to be talking about this afternoon and that we'll be discussing, uh, and that's the book Captives. It's really a pioneering book, um, as you'll see um, as she talks about it today. Um, it's understood really, it's seen as a classic. There have been conferences and, uh, uh, about the book, uh, seminars, um, and it's subverted in many of our existing assumptions about how we think about Britain and its empire. Instead of the standard picture of, of Britain's empire as the emanation of global power, or as experienced by its subjects as a well-lubricated machine of oppression, Linda Colley, in a sense, shows the, the trauma of empire for all concerned, for imperialists and their subjects, a, con a condition of psychological as well as social disruption and disorientation uh, that 
the consequences of which are still with us today. So, ladies and gentlemen, Linda Colley. Hello. Thank you, Sunil. Um, it's an enormous honor and an enormous pleasure to be here this afternoon on my very first visit to Jaipur. Uh, and thank you so much for coming to listen. But let me start with a confession. Unlike many authors at this great festival, I'm not presenting a brand new book. Captives was first published in 2002, though the latest translation into Japanese has just come out. Um, and in fact, this book has had a lot of different translations. And I say that not out of vanity, well, not just out of vanity. I think it's been translated into lots of languages because the threat of captivity, the process of becoming a captive, and how human beings react to the ordeal of captivity are experiences that have crossed all ages, all countries, all continents. Just think of some very comparatively recent examples. Uh, we see at the moment, unfortunately, how different kinds of armed groups use captive taking as a weapon. Think of ISIS and the use they make of captives on the web. We've seen in the past 50 years how a major captivity crisis can undermine the entire US presidency. In the Iran hostage crisis of 1979 to 1981, that captive taking really undermined the presidency of Jimmy Carter in the US. Conversely, we've also seen in recent decades how being a captive and then writing and talking about the ordeal of captivity can turn certain individuals into heroes and martyrs and celebrities. Uh, I suppose the most conspicuous example is Nelson Mandela who was a captive for 18 years on Robben Island in South Africa. Uh, and with great heroism, made that captivity work for him and for the struggle against apartheid. But the captives in this book are very different. In this book, as Sunil was suggesting, I look at how in the self-same period of time when they gradually established a massive empire, 1600 to 1850, very, very large numbers of British and Irish men and women are also taken captive. They are both captors and captives often. And I focus on three broad geographical areas. The Mediterranean region and North Africa, North America, and India and Central Asia. Now, you might say, isn't this a bit perverse? Um, surely, you might say, the British were very much taking captives at this time taking other people's lands, taking slaves in Africa and shipping them across the oceans, sending their own captive people to Australia, sending Indian and other prisoners to penal colonies and so on and so on. Well, yes indeed, and I'm not denying that at all. But what I do want to point out 
is that in the process of spreading across the globe so very greedily, things frequently go wrong for different kinds of Britons over time, and they fall captive. So what this book is about is really this hidden and forgotten underbelly of British empire making. The captors falling captive, if you like. So why do so many British and Irish get captured in this period? And I, I have to say the numbers are really large. Well, it's partly that when you think about it, Britain and Ireland are small countries. They have a limited population. They are stretched very thin. Things can go wrong. It's also the case that while the British Navy is powerful in the 18th and the 19th century, the British Army is not. Britain has one of the smallest armies of any of the major European powers, which is why, of course, in the Indian subcontinent, um, they are so dependent on Indian manpower. They just don't have large armies of their own. Until the 1830s, too, it's important to remember that on land, the British, like other Europeans, have no big technological advantage. Um, on the sea they do, but not on land. It's calculated, for example, in the 1780s, when the British are fighting Mysore in the south of India, Mysore cannon are better than the cannon the British are using. So again, the British can't rely on land on a technological edge for a long time. Fourthly, the British themselves are often divided. Um, people refer to the British Empire as though the British are monolithic. Well, of course they're not. They're divided by ethnicity, they're divided by class, they're divided by religion, and there's even more divisions between the British and varieties of Irish. And these divisions can weaken empire makers. Uh, one of the things that's been happening a lot in recent history is research into Britons becoming renegades, and also Britons joining mutinies. Um, there's quite a lot of mutinies in India in the late 18th, early 19th century, where British common soldiers mutiny in tandem with Indian soldiers. So there's a, a lot of complicated divisions going on. But finally, I think, why are Brits taken captive? Well, because it's a dangerous world. It's always a very dangerous world. And in the 17th and 18th and early 19th century, of course it was a dangerous world for everybody. In the Mediterranean, for example, um, British traders in the 17th century are very vulnerable to Corsair ships coming from North Africa, from places like Tripoli, Tunis, Morocco. These great Islamic Corsairing fleets, which take lots and lots of captives. We think about 20,000 British and Irish people are captive and very often enslaved in North Africa by the early 1700s. Now, as I say at the very start of this book, if we take this theme of captivity seriously, one of the things we can do is understand certain classic pieces of literature better. 
Let me just cite two great novels. Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, for instance. Now, of course, at the end of the story, Robinson Crusoe gets his own island. But before he ends up on that island, the novel makes clear that Robinson Crusoe is a slave. He's caught by Moroccan corsairs. He spends some time as a miserable slave, says Daniel Defoe in Morocco. Or think of Gulliver in Jonathan Swift's great novel of the 1720s, Gulliver's Travels. If you think about the plot of that book, it's about serial captivities. Gulliver is forever going on voyages and something goes wrong. He gets captured by very small people. He gets captured by very large people. In the end, he gets captured by the Hunanims, people in the shape of horses, uh, and goes over completely to them, becomes convinced that their civilization is much better than his own. Now, in this book, though, I don't use fictional sources in the main, though there's lots of novels I could have used. Instead, I use captivity narratives by people who were taken captive um, and either kept these narratives when they were captive and sometimes never got out, or escaped and wrote subsequently. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these captivity narratives. Some of them were published and became bestsellers. Some of them remain in manuscript. And, and of course, it's not just the British that produce captivity narratives. This is a, a genre that you see in many different cultures. And these are often raw and difficult and complicated sources. And there's captivity narratives by women and captivity narratives by men. Um, I wrote a book called The Ordeal of Elizabeth Marsh, which is about the tale of a female captive. Um, very dramatic story. But let me focus on some Indian captivities, because I think they give a rather different view of the British in India. And I know we'll be talking about that more tomorrow in another session on the East India Company. Between the 1760s and 1780s, two successive rulers of Mysore, Haider Ali and Tipu Sultan, take very large numbers of British troops and some British civilians captive. It's estimated by the early 1780s, Mysore, the rulers of Mysore, have taken one in five members of the British armed services in India captive. One in five. These are very large numbers indeed. Now, many of these Mysore captives died, but we have a great many narratives from this group surviving. So, why do I say that these narratives are often raw and vivid? Well, partly because they shatter a lot of illusions which the British like to have about themselves. Some British and Irish captives go over to my saw during their captivities. They decide to join the Mysore army and they fight for them. Some of them become Muslims, or at least try to become Muslims 
Some of them are even circumcised. Some are forced to be circumcised. And the accounts of this in the texts and how, how people try to make sense of this are very, very striking. Um, and I can talk about that more. But these narratives also show, I think, some of the psychological changes affected by captivity and some of the ways that captivity can change people, not in their bodies, but in their minds. Here, for example, is an extract about one of these Mysore captives. He's taken very young. He's only 14. He's a sailor working for the East India Company. He's captured by the French, passed on to Mysore. And for him, and he's called William Whiteway, captivity is a revelation because he's a working class boy from England. He's never had an education. But when he gets taken to Mysore, he is educated. He's instructed in Arabic as a preparatory to acquiring some knowledge of the Persian language. Uh, and when White Way talks about his experiences in the 1820s, he's very flattering about the teachers, some of the teachers he had in Mysore. He also breaks away from conventional British patriotic positions. He admits that the conditions Haider Ali and Tipu Sultan inflicted on some of their British captives were cruel. But he says this is not a fair criterion by which to estimate their characters. And anyway, says White Way, what did the British expect? Aggression, he says, provokes retaliation. In other words, he's come to see, through being a captive, a very different set of views about what is happening in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, he describes Tipu Sultan not as a tyrant, but as calmly, noble, an encourager of learning in all its branches. He subsequently tells the British when he's released that being captive in Mysore was about the happiest time in his life. So these narratives can be very subversive. They can also be fantastic anthropological sources. Uh, they can tell us about um, different views and racial and cultural exchanges from a perspective of British weakness. And I think that's very, very interesting. And there's lots more examples I could cite. Now, all the people I've just quoted, and all the people, well, not all the people, but many of the people in this book, are armed invaders of other people's land, though that doesn't apply to the people captured in the Mediterranean. And when I first published this book, Edward Said, uh, a great man with whom I sometimes argued, asked me, he asked me if I, quote, felt sorry for these individuals, people like William Whiteway. And the answer is no. Um, I don't feel sorry for them. I don't think it's the historian's job to feel sorry or not sorry. It's to try to understand, which is what I endeavor to do. But feeling sorry is certainly not why I wrote Captives. I wanted to write this book 
to break away from and help sabotage straightforward interpretations of British empire that have it rising inexorably and then falling. I think it's a lot more complicated and untidy than that. And so I wanted to stress in this book this empire's frequent and erratic vulnerability. British Empire becomes briefly huge and has massive, often violent, effects. But it is important to remember that by global standards, this same British Empire doesn't last very long. Not by the standards, say, of the Ottomans or of the Chinese. Maritime empires are terrifying things, but they are often more vulnerable than land empires. I also wanted in this book, though, to bring out individual stories which were not uncommon, but which have been often glossed over or forgotten because they don't seem to fit. Brian Keenan, an Irishman who was held captive for four years in Beirut in the 1980s, wrote in his published captivity narrative of how he had often felt while being captive, quote, a tiny insignificant pawn in a global game over which I had no control. A lot of the people I write about are pawns. They are, many of them, working class, poor people who are in games that many of them don't understand. But more broadly, I suppose, I wanted to draw attention to captivity as a subject and to what I call the captivity archive, which, as I say, can be explored for many, <coughs> many peoples. In other words, and to be brief, I suppose I wanted to shake things up. Thank you. I'm just going to give you a lapel mic. Thank you so much, Linda, for setting out the themes and the, some of the detail of the book. Um, I thought what I'd do is I'll just start off with a few questions to bring out other aspects of the book, and then we can open it up um, sure. to questions from the audience. And I wanted to, to pick up on what's such a powerful point and theme of the book, which is really to overturn, to turn on a, on a really give a somersault to how we think about the empire. And, and um, also, you know, what you were saying earlier about how those bits of the imperial story that don't fit, which get forgotten. And it's very striking that you begin your book um, um, uh, about uh, sort of in the mid-17th century with two, uh, mid-17th century when Britain acquires two port cities. One, of course, is Bombay and the other is Tangiers, um, both coming from the, the Portuguese. And um, Tangiers, which is generally known as a kind of hotbed of dissolute bohemian lifestyle, and yet you start the story of empire in Tangiers and not in Bombay. And what were you, what do you, what were you hoping to show by starting the story there? Well, I, I wanted to show various things. Um, people don't often think of the Mediterranean and North Africa as sites of British imperial endeavor. But actually, of course, the Mediterranean is vital. Um, lots of ultimately small naval bases there like Gibraltar, Menorca. But Tangier is something that the British really 
put an enormous amount of money and effort in in the 1670s and 1680s. I mean, they take Tangier far more seriously initially than they take what was then Bombay because uh, they see this as the Mediterranean is a rich sea. Uh, Tangier is going to be their point of contact. Um, this is going to be wonderful. And it all goes wrong. And the Moroccan peoples and armies um, take Tangier back in the 1680s. So it has a very different storyline. Um, and it also helped me to talk about British attitudes to Islam and the way that Islam seems so powerful to many Britons. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why Oxford University starts becoming interested in Islamic studies in the 17th century. It's partly because of the power still of the Ottoman Empire, but it's also because so many of these sailors are being captured by North African Islamic states, uh, Morocco particularly, but also Tripoli and Tunis. And so more people in England have got to get some acquaintance with Islamic cultures and languages in order to negotiate these captives' freedom. So I deliberately wanted to start with Tangier, as I say, to start shaking things up, to get people to look at the geography of British power and powerlessness in a rather different way. Mm. I mean, one of the things that's very striking about many of the stories you tell of the figures in the book is, is their chameleon character, the way they often shift um, who they are allegiant to. And I, I wanted to just, there's almost a kind of constant psychic uh, turncoating going on in many of the figures you write about. And I think it points to something deeper that's, that's running through the book, which, which, which is the changing nature of the objects of allegiance. The, the assumption that somehow there was the empire or the British nation which people were allegiant to, uh, and, and that was all very clear. That seems to blur a lot. And even, even things like race or religion are not obvious objects of allegiance. People can switch. And, and I, I wonder, I mean, one of the things that, that strikes me about the book is it shows how during this long span of imperial expansion, uh, uh, there's a great fluidity to the kinds of identities that are at play, which is so different from the standard story, which is mm. told in terms of imperialists and colonized and so on. And I wonder if you might just sort of explore that theme a bit more, uh, particularly at a moment uh, like today, where a, there seems to be uh, a push towards a more hardened sense of identities. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I tend to assume that most of us, many of us, have multiple identities and are capable of reconciling them or not, or different identities will come uppermost in different situations and emergencies. Um, I don't think it's any great surprise when for much of the period I'm looking at, after, after the 1830s, it changes a lot. But for much of the 17th century, the 18th century, the early 19th century, um, for example, the life of a working class British Irish soldier who gets sent to India, say, it's not very good. Um, he's likely to be there for decades. He'll never get back. Um, if he is able to marry at all, it will, of course, be to an Indian woman 
he's not allowed to bring wives with him from Britain. Um, he may serve, as I say, 20, 30 years if he survives. So what kind of identity does that man have? He, he will probably be multilingual. Um, his treatment is poor. Um, poor in a way that is really quite shocking. Um, extreme example. In 1835, the Governor General of India, Sir William Bentinck, decides, not before time, that Indian soldiers working for the East India Company, Indian-born soldiers, will not be flogged if they are accused of doing something wrong. However, Bentinck says, if you're a British or an Irish soldier, you can keep being flogged um, because these are peasants from home. The, the attitude is very, very strange. Um, and so I think at all levels, these identities and class identities can sometimes overwhelm ethnic, religious, racial identities. I, I think these, these need to be probed, uh, not assumed. Uh, can I, in fact, just maybe probe that a little bit? So, so some, in some cases, these identities were imposed or forced. Um, the, the, the person didn't have much choice uh, if they were forcibly uh, made to convert or whatever. But in some cases, they were actively chosen. And, and as a historian working with often quite fragmentary sources, were you able and how were you able to make judgments between where there seemed to be actually voluntary um, embracings of a different religion or a different form of culture versus these uh, you know, captivities where it was more imposed or a subject of power, really? Um, the evidence is very complicated because obviously if if some of these captives get back to Britain, they have to rationalize their behavior. They're likely to say, I was forced. I didn't believe it, but I had to. Um, so I looked at all these sources with a certain amount of skepticism, and I tried to track uh, one captive through another captive's account. So if another captive is saying, well, Private Jones decided to be circumcised and is now becoming a Muslim, he chose to do this, then I take that kind of testimony seriously because why should the guy make it up? But I do think that these people are slipping back and forth. Um, Another example uh, from a different site of captivity, Joseph Pitts, um, very interesting man, long-term captive in Morocco, in the 1720s, writes the first long account of the Hajj that is ultimately published in the English language. Um, and it's quite a nuanced account. It contains considerable anthropological value. And the fact that he was allowed to go on the Hajj suggests that clearly local people trusted him. They didn't feel he was just making a show. So I think, you know, I try not to be naive about these sources. And people, of course, always tell stories about themselves. But I think you can track some of these individuals over time and check their testimonies against other sources. Mm. I, I wanted to get the audience to have a sense of the actual physicality of some of these objects and notebooks and diaries that you write about. Because you know, you, you've really been one, one of the first, if not the first historian, to use these captivity narratives. And, uh, 
you, illustri you have illustrations of some of them in the book, and they're extraordinary documents. Um, mm. and, and you tell about how they were written, how th they were transported out of prison, in some cases in very peculiar parts of the anatomy. anatomy. Um, and and I, I just wondered if you, you, if, if you could just tell us a bit about you know, what it felt like to work with these manuscripts, often written in telegrammatic code writing, uh, very difficult to read, uh, I mean, it's not the usual kind of archive that a historian works with. No, um, there's a particularly um, extreme example which I found in the India Office Library in London, which is now part of the British Museum. And it was written by uh, an Irish army officer called Cromwell Massey, who was, again, one of these captives in Mysore. And it's, it's tiny. It's about four inches by two inches. And it's sort of, because paper, paper is so difficult to get hold of. Um, you know, in any prison situation, if you're not being given paper, where do you get paper from? So one of the first things they have to do is um, try and craft their own paper or they, if they've bought a book with them, um, perhaps a Bible or something else, they tear pages out and they scribble in the margins. Um, but Massey's um, text is truly extraordinary, um, and it contains a, a remarkable line um, and forgive me if I offend anybody, I don't mean to, but he, it has this extraordinary line, um, terribly worried today for our foreskins, um, because they are in the middle of these voluntary changing overs, violations, whatever they were. Um, and Cromwell Massey never published his narrative. It was too raw. Um, and some of these narratives just disappeared. Sometimes their owners died or they were thrown away. Um, but they are extraordinary, really extraordinary texts. And I, I emphasize you can find uh, narratives extraordinary narratives like this, strange physical objects. How, how do you keep a record of your captive experience? What do you do? Um, and it doesn't have to be paper, of course. Some people scrawl things on coins. Um, we've found some cases in North Africa where people scrawl things on walls and they cover it up. And it's only when the wall gets changed that you reveal this writing underneath. I think it's this urge, which is not peculiar to the British, obviously. It's this urge to testify, uh, not to be wiped out, um, to make sure that somebody perhaps will know your story, even if you won't live to tell it. Um, they are documents on the edge. Mm. I'm just going to hug one more question and then open it up. I mean, out, of this, out of this book, Captives, another book grew um, out of one of the narratives of one of the people you discovered uh, in writing Captives, the, the story of Elizabeth Marsh. And I wanted to ask you about um, the kind of fragmentary nature of the sources that you had to use, and indeed one often has to use as a historian in these cases. Um, the, 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 really, the, the, you, you write in the, your subsequent book, The Ordeal of uh, Elizabeth Marsh, about the, the, the subject of historical uncertainty mm -hmm. as well. You know, how as a historian one is often feeling one's way in the dark in trying to reconstruct the details of a life. And I wondered, as a, as a profession, are historians um, candid enough about that? Um, because I, you, I mean, you write very eloquently about something that I'm sure every historian feels. Um, but do you think there's enough um, uh, uh, translucence um, about what we can't know and what we're doing when we don't actually know those details? 
or what we can do? Um, I suppose the short answer is no. I don't think there's enough transparency about this. When I wrote about this woman, Elizabeth Marsh, who um, is a captive in Morocco, um, taken in the Mediterranean, uh, subsequently, uh, later on in her life, comes to India uh, and lives in Dhaka, uh, which was then under uh, the company's control um, and is buried in Calcutta, as it was then. Um, and again, her social origins are limited, though she's literate and she, she can write. She's not a great writer. But there was large bits of her life, and particularly when she's captive in Morocco, um, because she does, she really does, and I've confirmed this, she really does almost disappear into a harem there. Um, but there was a lot of things that I couldn't know. And so I made a resolution with that book and some people have been critical of this, some people have liked it, um, but some people have said, well, Linda, why, why didn't you make it up? Why didn't you turn this into a hybrid, part history, part novel? Um, and I refuse to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm rather suspicious of what passes for history books when someone says, she must have felt, or he must have thought. Well, why must he? Um, we don't know. Um, but I know some of my readers have found this infuriating. One of my reviewers, um, Claire Tomlin, who is a great biographer but writes about elite figures or people with large archives, said, Linda, why didn't you tell us more about her relationship with her husband? We would have loved to know. And I said, yes, Claire, I would have loved to know. But I haven't found the sources yet. And I don't believe in making things up. So, what I tried to do in that book is document her from as many archives as possible. Um, though we have found five more letters by Elizabeth Marsh, which, believe me, is an achievement for that woman. Um, but that's since I published. Mm. But to make it clear, um, there's certain things like her relationship with her husband. We don't know. Well, I think um, the words, I don't believe in making things up, should be engraved on all our foreheads today as the 46th president is inaugurated across a few oceans. Um, I'll open this up to questions now. Um, there's microphones around, so just raise your hands if you have a question. Yes, there's one at the back there. Please translate if I have Yeah, please go ahead. I wanted to ask about the politics of the term captivity. Would you say someone in colonial India booked under sedition law would be held captive? Sorry, I can't. Sorry, could, could we try to see where you... She's sitting over there. Yeah, could, could you just uh, re restate the last bit of the question? Basically, what I was trying to ask is, would you use the word captivity for state-sanctioned imprisonment that is unfair and against the rule of law? Would I use captivity the term? for state-sanctioned imprisonment that is unfair. Um, yes. Um, uh, you know, captivity 
is arguably a very, can be a very decorous term for varieties of imprisonment. Um, there are many forms of captives and um, I think one of the interesting things I found when writing this book was the way that people, of course, imposed divisions in their thinking, um, how they could imprison and take captive um, and think that was acceptable while feeling very moved and appalled by their own kind being taken captive. So I think terms like captivity, prisoner, um, like all these semantic terms need probing and examining. Um, it often depends on whose side you're on. Yeah, it's, I think one of the richnesses of the book that you talk about so many different varieties of captivity. So there's slaves, abductees, prisoners of war, renegades, um, and, and actually seeing also how that terminology changes over time according to different uh, imperatives. But uh, yeah, there's a question just here at the front. Um, so I wanted to ask you how are these captives viewed once they once they went back to Britain? Uh, were they viewed with suspicion? Uh, because I don't know that you watched the American TV series Homeland. Uh, so is it, you know, is it because there's a lot, of, because there's also at one level you want them back, but then you may not trust them if they've spent so much time and they're so empathetic to their captors. Yes, that's a, that's a very good and appropriate question. Um, I think it's not, it's not like Homeland because obviously technologies are different. They're not going to pass information on um, in that kind of way. But they are clearly in some cases mistrusted by their neighbors. Um, it's also, though, very common, uh, a kind of, I mean, this is a bit like the Manchurian candidate, that, you know, they don't fit back in, which, after all, is also the plot of Gulliver's Travels. Um, at the end of Swift's Gulliver's Travels, he says he can't even eat at the same table with his wife because for his refined senses now, she smells. Um, and we know that um, when Pitts, the man who goes on the Hajj in the 1720s, when he gets back finally to Britain in the 1730s, um, he can't settle. Uh, and the only way he can get any kind of peace is he checks out the Moroccan ambassador in London. Uh, I suspect, I don't think to pass on information, but he wants to hear languages that he knows and which his neighbors in England don't know. And he immediately, pretty soon, leaves as a sailor and disappears. So I think there, there is signs of suspicion but there's also sides, particularly if it's been a long captivity or an ambivalent captivity. How you can fit back in, whatever that means, is a, a very difficult process. Well, you also have the story of a late 18th century, rather poor woman who goes back to, to England and makes her living cooking curries. Yes, back in Sarah <laughs> Shea, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you very much for that fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you. And it's hugely important work. I'm very, very sympathetic to the project that you outline of complicating the history of colonialism. So it isn't just a group of people sweeping in and amassing absolute power, but within even the colonizers, there are all these different groups which are in conflict with each other or which are unkind to each other or not in unison with each other in what they're doing.
but these kinds of micro histories that go against the grain of the larger histories that we know uh, still are micro histories. And the larger history still is a history that these people did come and they did amass a large empire and they did rule for a large number of years. So this kind of history writing which looks at unorthodox sources to tell histories against the grain, it does it, you know, ha has it changed the story or has it just added texture to the story that we actually still find fairly settled in its broad outline? Um. Again, I think that's a, a huge and interesting question. Um, I think it's a lot more than texture. As I tried to say at the end, um, one of the things I wanted to do was to get rid of a kind of empire goes up, empire goes down, and point out that there's a lot of crises and dark doubts and panics uh, many of them connected with these kind of captivity crises. Um, for example, in 1784, in the wake of these Mysore captivities, which, as I say, are taking a fifth of British armed forces, which is huge. Um, and this is also in the aftermath of Britain losing the American colonies so to speak. I mean, I always like this concept, losing the colonies, as though you've sort of mislaid them. Um, but, you know, they've been defeated in America. They see themselves imprisoned in Mysore. Uh, and you can see in parliamentary debates in the early 1780s, and indeed Parliament passes a resolution in 1784, we are not expanding anymore in India. Um, it's not worth it, we can't do it, it's dangerous. Um, now, of course, they get over that, but the fact that this is being debated in Parliament in the 1780s, um, and I think the degree of precariousness, I mean, even in the 1840s, the Governor General of India, the British Governor General of India, writes down because he's in the middle of another captivity crisis with Afghanistan. Uh, and he writes down, he says, I do not know how we are allowed to hold this country for a day. Um, so, you know, he's caught in the midst of a panic. Now, of course, the empire goes on, but I think we have to monitor these periods of insecurity and doubt and ambiguity. Otherwise, I think you misperceive what used to be called the official mind. So I don't think it's just working class stories. Okay, well, I've just been given the signal that we have to end the session, but um, I would really urge you to pick up a copy of the book. It's a fantastically rich book. Uh, that moves between, as Linda was earlier saying, sort of descriptions of the very material circumstances of many of these captivities to very large and thematic questions about the nature of empire. And it really is one of the most important books that's been written about Britain and its empire uh, in many decades. So thank you very much, Linda, for telling thank us you, about the book today. Thank you so much for that absolutely fascinating session. I definitely need to pick up a copy of that book. Thank you to Sunil Kalani and Linda Kali and to BBC World Histories magazine. Thank you, Thank you so much, Sunil.
Namaste. Welcome to the Z Jaipur Literature Festival.